Uh, so this is our fifth session. So uh, this is our fifth session as part of our fundraising 101 series, and I can see a lot of you are repeat participants. So really, really glad to have you on this session. Um, so today's session, as I mentioned, is on retail fundraising for nonprofits, and I'm super excited about this session. So uh, in 2019, Satwa had launched a report on uh, everyday giving, uh, which focuses on retail fundraising. And I think uh, one of the key findings from the study is that uh, individual fundraising and individual giving is one of the most rapidly growing channels in India for the last few years and with the potential to grow much, much further, right? Uh, and on the other hand, it's surprising that it's also one of the, probably the least staff channels, right? Uh, after we look at institutional channels and so on is that we come to uh, retail fundraising today. Uh, given that uh, maybe compared to the institutional fundraising, the level of scrutiny or compliance is lesser here and given the flexibility with the funds, right? Uh, because we receive a lot of unrestricted funding through individual uh, donations. I was wondering why this gap, uh, why people have not been leveraging um, retail fundraising enough. Maybe it is due to the fact that we don't really understand what it is, right? What is the relevance? How, how can we as an organization use it for our fundraising objectives, what are the different options we have, what are the kind of investments that we require. So I am sure that we have a lot of Hello. Um, can you all hear me? We can hear you. Um, Ashwini, can you confirm if you can hear me? Can hear you, can hear you. Can you hear us, Vinu? You can hear me? Um, yeah, yeah, now I can hear you. Just let me know if you cannot hear me, okay? Yeah. I'll just maybe close my video. The network is probably not great. Yeah. Okay. Hello. I'm, I'm sorry for the uh, technical glitch, but for some reason, uh, just keep disconnecting. We can hear you, Meena. Okay. Yeah. So I was just saying that uh, probably the reason why we have not been able to leverage retail fundraising so much is because we don't understand that particular channel uh, really well. And today I'm hence super excited uh, to welcome the team from Dana Mojo, who uh, understands this space really well and who's here today to share with us uh, their understanding and wisdom of this space. So I'm sure uh, most of you must have heard and know about Dana Mojo, but for people who don't know, I'll just give a brief about them. Uh, Ashwin, if you can move on to the next slide. So Dana Mojo is a... Um, online uh, payment platform uh, and which focuses on how they can transform the way NGOs interact and engage with their donors on a daily basis uh, with the objective of uh, increasing the uh, giving or the funding. Uh, so the initial goal of Dana Mojo is to equip uh, 10,000 NGOs with an easy way to collect donations from their donors. Uh, and having a system in place which helps them to engage with their donors in a consistent and a convenient manner. They believe that this can have a transformative effect on giving in this country. So uh, welcome Dana Mojo team, super excited to have you here. I'll also give a brief uh, intro of the uh, two people we have here from 
on the team. So we have uh, Mr. Dhawan, who is the CEO and founder of Danamojo. He's an alumnus of IMA and a computer science graduate from BJTI Mumbai. So he has an experience of over 15 years uh, across technology, management, consulting and philanthropy advisory. He has worked with uh, multinationals before he began his uh, journey in social sector with Give India. So he was the CEO of Give India for four years. And during his tenure, uh, I think the retail fundraising increased from rupees 7 crore to rupees 42 crore uh, through more than 150,000 donors, which is, I think, quite an impressive number. Uh, Davil is also an Aspen Fellow and a part of India Leadership Initiative. Uh, he has written articles on philanthropy and social sector for multiple publications such as Forbes, Times of India, Hindu Business Line, etc. Um, a pleasure to have you here, Davil. Uh, really looking forward to the session with you. Along with Davil, we also have uh, Chitra Kothari. She's a graduate in computer engineering and have done her master's in business administration from Mumbai. Her work experience varies uh, in different sectors from financial services company to multinational IT company. She also worked with Lokmat Group, uh, which is Maharashtra's number one newspaper for planning, organizing and executing events under them. Uh, she was involved in corporate communications and has worked with teams across Maharashtra. She comes with around 14 plus years of experience and currently is working with Dana Mojo as a senior sales consultant. Uh, Chitra, welcome you to this session as well. Uh, super, super uh, excited to have you both here. Um, so uh, in today's session, we will, I think the team here will be covering a lot on retail fundraising, talking to you about uh, the relevance of retail fundraising, how as an organization you can leverage retail fundraising. They'll also talk about uh, the Dana Mojo payment solution and give you an overview of uh, the solution. And as part of this collaboration, I think uh, the team also has an offer to the participants uh, who are attending this webinar. Uh, I let the team talk about all of this in detail uh, um, as they take you through the content. Uh, lastly, uh, as we always say, uh, please feel free to share your questions on the chat. We have a dedicated Q&A session towards the end of uh, uh, this um, duration. So uh, probably from 5.30 to 6, we'll be having a dedicated Q&A. We'll take up all your questions uh, during that slot. But meanwhile, please feel free to put your questions on the chat. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, over to uh, the Dana Mojo team to take it up from here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Meenu. And thank you, uh, Sattva, for having um, us out here. Uh, we're delighted to be part of this uh, initiative to reach out to more NGOs and the sessions that you are doing for them. That's a great initiative and we hope we can add value out here. So uh, welcome everybody. Fantastic to see now close to 100 participants uh, on this webinar. Absolutely fantastic. And I want this to be as much of an interactive discussion as is uh, possible. And uh, towards that goal, I would ask uh, as many of you uh, to open up your videos so that even I can see you and uh, I know who's uh, who's behind these screens and who's asking questions and we can have a lot more of an interactive session. It's just a lot more fun to uh, see people while you're interacting with them. Right. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, great to see already a lot of faces and would just encourage everyone to uh, do it. Uh, so as we go through that, uh, let me uh start off with uh, you know asking a couple of questions as we aim to make this an engaging session uh while the presentation is going on feel free to put your questions in the chat window uh if relevant and if possible uh, i will try to answer some of them during this conversation and as minu said that we can always take them together uh, we can always take the unanswered ones at the end uh, as well okay so uh, let me start off uh, with the couple of questions that I have. I know all of you all have filled out a form, answered a lot of questions, but I think it'd just be good for everyone to out here to see the responses uh, to some of this. So I'm going to use a tool. I'm not sure if uh, how many of you all, many of you all might have actually used this called Menti. Okay, so I'm going to ask everyone to go to this website, www.menti.com that you can see on your screen. Uh, and use the code which is mentioned out here and you will get a question uh, please answer that question you will get exactly this question 
please answer that question out here. So how many of you actively raise funds via individual donors? Now, I think the key out here is actively. Uh, somebody, so what I mean by actively is you actually outreach, you pursue individual donors, you reach out to them, you have campaigns, you do engagement, you do a lot of work with uh, these organizations. Right, so I'm just going to ask that everyone uh, does that. I'll just. So if everyone can just start putting it down, just we'll have a small uh, counter that we can just start off so that we get through this quickly. Right. Uh, please answer this in the main menti so that we can see overall, uh, you know, how much of uh, people are actually raising funds and others can also see it. Uh, do not answer it in the chat box. I will request everyone to answer it in menti itself. Right. So I'm assuming everyone's got their uh, doubts in. If, if you haven't and you yet need to answer, then let me know. So, but this is interesting uh, to see half of this audience out here who is actually raising funds actively from individual donors. I'm very happy about it. Uh, to already see such a wide adoption, I think this number would have been very different two years ago pre-COVID. Uh, so it's fantastic to see so many people, so many organizations raise funds online. Okay, coming to my next question now. Uh, one second. Yeah. So on your mentee screens, you would have received the next question. What comes to your mind when you think of individual donors? Just write whatever you think comes to your mind and think of it as, as you are a fundraiser, you are trying to reach out to individual donors. What comes to your mind as a fundraiser when you think of individual donors? Any, just a word, two words, three words, whatever comes to your mind. Unrestricted fund, big corporate comes to your mind when it's individual, okay? Let us see if you can see any trends forming out here. If you can see some of these terms and you agree with these terms, I would request you to also make these terms, put these terms in. So we're seeing unrestricted is one thing that seems to be coming up a lot of the most. Use the words that you are already seeing out here. If you think that you identify with it, it will help for the larger ideas to come up. Unrestricted, unrestricted. <laughs> this is interesting that we think of uh, individual donors as unrestricted funding. Okay. Uh, let's just give it another 10 seconds and I think we can wrap it up. I think the larger theme of unrestricted is the one that seems to be coming up. Uh, every emotional connect. I think that's another one that's clearly coming out. Uh, okay, great. I think this is fantastic. I think unrestricted and emotional are the two broad ideas that seem to be coming out of this and we will take and both of these are important towards understanding the value of individual donors and how they are very different from other kinds of uh, donations and how as a result of that, it is very important to diversify your fundraising in the individual donor segment because they are very different, right? Uh, okay, so let me move ahead from here and just share my presentation with you and let's take it forward from there. Okay, great. So uh, let me tell you where I'm going to be, or, you know, what I'm going to address in this uh, conversation with all of y'all. Uh, I'm going to focus on two broad themes. 
Uh, I'm going to focus on the first thing being the power of individual donors. Why are they very important? Uh, why you should look at individual donors in a more active fashion, especially for the ones who haven't, who are not currently doing. And the second theme is around why online giving or online donations are very important. Now, this is again, obviously for both the segments, equally important for those who are actively raising money, why it is important to think about the online segment, uh, how to think about online giving as an important and strategic part of your overall fundraising from individual donors. So let's start off with talking about individual donors in terms of some numbers. Uh, sorry, before that, let's just break up to say what are the different kinds of sources of donations. So by and large, we talk about four sources of donations. First is government. Second is institutional and foundations. Third is corporates. And fourth is individuals. Individuals is generally broke up in, broken up into two segments, uh, the retail donor and the h &I donor. Uh, h &I means high net worth individual or a person who's uh, giving a large amount of money. So giving a large amount of money, not necessarily someone who has a lot, large amount of money. right? If you have a large amount of money, but if you're not giving, that doesn't make you an h &I donor. So somebody who's giving a large amount of money is what we would call as an h &I donor. So let us first try to understand how much do individuals give and how much are individuals giving uh, across the world, across in India, more importantly. So as a benchmark, I'd like to start off. Oh, okay. As a benchmark, I'd like to start off by telling you about the US where 76% of all giving is by individuals and foundations and institutions contribute about 20%. And just about 4% is corporates, right? So 76% of giving in the US is individual. I would love to hear from you guys on what do you think, and you can put down your responses in the chat box, in the chat window. What do you think is the similar number in India? What is the rate of giving in India by individuals? Even if you don't know, guess. Just put down a number, guess if you don't know. So I'm saying 10, 15, 20, less than 20. Somebody said 40, 10, 8, 8, 5. Okay, we're seeing 35, 50, 20. Few people in the 40 range. But a lot of y'all are basically saying 5 to 20, 10 to 20%. Right? So that's uh, what do you think it is around 10 to 20%. Now let's look at what it is in India. Now this is based on tax deductions that have been claimed in the 2019-20 financial year. So corporates were giving 62% of all giving was by corporates and by individuals was 38%. We are not counting institutions in this picture because they don't have, their own foundations don't claim tax benefits. They're already NGOs, they don't claim tax benefits, so they're not included. But just corporates and India and individuals are what we're looking at. So 38% of all giving in India is by individuals. I think the question I'm going to leave you behind with to think with on this slide is to say, is 38% of your effort in fundraising focused on individuals? Is it more than that? Is it less than that? If it is less than that, what should you be doing? Now, I will further argue that this 38% is actually heavily underestimated. Because like I said, this is based only on the tax deductions claim. And I will tell you why it is underestimated, right? So in our estimate, we think giving in, in, in by individuals already more than corporates because all corporates will claim tax exemption. That is why all their donations get captured in the system. But individuals don't necessarily claim tax exemptions. In fact, uh, based on conversations with of large organizations, many NGOs, we feel that the number of individuals claiming tax exemption is probably 60 to 70%. So we can easily think that instead of 38% out here, this is probably closer to 50% donations are by individuals. Further individual donations, the tax benefit is capped at 10%. But there are many donors, especially h &I, who give more than 10% of their income and they don't get a tax benefit. Now that doesn't get captured in this system. 
Further, many HNIs give via shares as well. Right, shares, wills, bequests. Again, this is not captured in the data because in India, there are no tax benefits for that purpose. Right? Yeah, Satyan out here says that there's high percentage of unorganized giving. That's also true, right? High percentage of unorganized giving by individuals will also make this more. But we, what we are comparing out here, Satyan, is actually the organized giving because we're doing a like-to-like -like comparison between the US and India. So even on organized giving to secular causes, non-religious causes, is already 38%. And I will show to you, so this is based, uh, Pallavi, this is based on the value of the donation, not the number of donors. Number-wise, I'm sure individual will probably be 99% or at least more than 95%. Uh, so this is based on the value of the donation. And uh, this number, as I'm going to show you in the next slide, was actually higher and uh, reduced in 2019-20. And there were two reasons for it, right? So as you can see over the past few years, individual giving was growing. From about, sorry, I don't have the years here, but this is basically from about 2016-17 of 39%. It has gone to 48% in 18-19. And then during the COVID year, we had a huge amount of CSR giving that happened. As a result of which CSR share dramatically increased. Also donors, individual donors started giving lesser for multiple reasons from their own uh, COVID related issues, job loss potential, all of that uncertainties. Uh, we saw reduced giving as a percentage, but not on an absolute level. So on an absolute level, giving yet increased. Over the last four years, while corporate giving has increased 150%, individual giving has also kept pace with 145%. And out of this 150% of corporate giving, 70% came in the last year itself. So last year was actually a miss, uh, was different. Uh, sorry, not last year, but 2019, 20. And I am sure that as we go ahead, we will see corporate giving actually drop a lot from this 25,000 crore uh, figure that we have today. Right? So we will see a significant drop from this in uh, 21, 22, at least, if not 2021. Right? While individual giving will keep growing as it has always done. Even if we look at last five years data, we will see that in three years out of these five years, individual giving has actually outpaced corporate giving. A lot more of individual giving is happening compared to corporate uh, giving. It is growing faster. And I think, uh, you know, again, this is only based on the tax reductions claim. So if you think about the fact that at least another half of these people don't claim tax reduction and you add another 50% or one third of people don't claim tax reduction, you'll add 50% to this number. So instead of seeing 15,000 crores, it will probably be closer to 20,000 crores, 22,000 crores. So I, we strongly believe that individual giving in India is already more than corporate giving uh, that has been happening. Now, uh, the important theme uh, that I want to focus on out here is not that one should leave everything and do individual giving. Uh, I think it's great that 50% of you are already actively doing it. Uh, so I want to tell you why this is important to do, especially the other 50% who are probably not actively doing it and why it is a good diversification source, right? So you have, like we put down out here, five kind of different sources of giving uh, of areas from where you can raise donations and how you can actually what is the difference between each of these sources and why individual retail giving more specifically, individual retail giving more specifically comes out as a different source and is a diversified source and why it is very different. So that's what I want to just focus on in the next few slides. Uh, one of the common questions I get at this point of time is how do we know what is an HNI donor? Can we classify it? Who is a retail donor? Can we classify it? So I, I have two uh, two thumb rules which I use to classify an HNI donor, you could choose either of them. So one is to say that which is who is the donor or at what amount of money are you willing to go and meet the donor twice a year and give a, give a report, give a feedback of your program. For a smaller organization, that could be 1 lakh rupees a year. And for a larger organization, that could be 10 lakh rupees a year, right? It is really the amount at which you are willing to engage with that person. You think it's worth your while to do it. 
obviously for 1000 rupees you may not want to go and meet a person right so i think this is something that each organization can use and if you just want a thumb rule i think 1 lakh rupees is a good number to have so if it's more than 1 lakh it's hni less than 1 lakh it's uh, retail is the way you can look at it retail is basically small value donations so we can assume that anyone who's giving less than 1 lakh rupees is a retail donor so now let us look at how these segments are different right so first we must understand why does each of these segments give why do governments give why do foundations give and so on right so with government and foundation it is about solving a problem they want to solve a problem of hunger they want to solve a problem of uh, livelihoods they want to solve a problem of finance access to finance right so these are the reasons why somebody would want to give on the other hand in case of uh, corporate and csr largely it's being uh, requested as someone it's largely being uh, requested as someone who's doing it from a legal perspective or a social responsibility or a branding perspective okay an individual or an hri uh, and retail is more about giving back to society personal reasons father was afflicted with cancer uh, the kind of thing there's a duty to give back there's a guilt conscience as peer pressure right so it could be any of these kind of things how do they decide what is the decision making process for each of them so with government they will give you money if it matches a fund or a scheme or policy right with the foundation it's about if they have a problem that they are looking to solve and you are in the same area then they are likely to give money with you with a corporate or csr either you need to connect with a ceo or a cxo or it has to be in one of their focus areas but for an individual and this is again different for each and i versus retail for an hni it's about focus areas that there is one important thing it must match the focus areas but then it can also be based on trust connect knowing the person if they think you are good you are doing good work if they trust you they can give to you on the individual retail level it's largely trust and connection it's an emotional decision mostly while the rest of the case if you see they're all rational they're more rational decisions than emotional with the first three it's completely rational because there's a decision making process there is a committee that is being formed who are deciding on the basis of their policies their schemes on behalf of somebody else but in case of individual that they themselves deciding on giving their own money and when that happens the decision making process is much faster right so how would you reach them right how would you reach a government or an institution how can you reach them not how would you but how can you reach them so the first two segments is simply it's like a cold call right i mean if a scheme policy matches for the government you can apply for it similarly for a foundation if they have a certain uh, you know theory of change if they have a certain focus area you can write into them it is their goal it's the objective of the organization to solve a problem and that's why they are going to uh, reach out to you that they are going to uh, you know listen to you they're going to look at your proposal on the other hand with corporates a lot of it is based on referrals that you would like to have some referrals Uh, they would like to get you through referrals through somebody's word of mouth they've heard of your organization individual and hni is purely purely word of mouth it is purely connection this purely word of mouth they have to know you from somebody who they trust you cannot approach them on a cold basis it does not work it will never work and then you have individual retail which is really your own friends and family right and so what i'm trying to say from this is each and every organization and each and every person out here has a potential donor base with them that they can reach out to they do not need any connection they do not need any referrals it is a lot easier to reach out to these people and this is again another big difference between the individual retail segment and all other segments like i was talked about the decision making process so who makes the decision right obviously for the first three segments it's the government officers or the committee which is making why the last segment is more of family individuals that are making this decision it's the person deciding for himself so it's like you are also a donor and you are deciding for yourself who you want to give to your decision making process is going to be much faster than if you as a grant officer of your organization has to decide where your ngo has to give a grant money to 
right? Because that cannot be only your decision. That will be more of a committee decision, more of a trustee decision. And you will play a role in that, but it isn't only yours, which makes the process a lot slower, right? So whoever decides with for their own money, the process is always faster, right? And that's what, that is another reason why an individual donors as a diversification source is very, very important, why they're different and why they should be one of the many sources that you should tap into or one of the four sources that you have you should tap into at least three of them. And out of those three, I would strongly urge individual to be one of them, right? Whether it's h &I, whether it's retail, it's up to you, but I think it's important to have at least one of these sources. And like I said, that's why they provide a very uh, true source of diversification because they have an emotional impulse led mechanism in retail compared to government or other segments, which are largely rational in nature. Now, when they decide to donate, for how long are they going to donate? Governments will typically be a year. Institution foundations can be maybe five to seven years. Corporate CSR can also be three to five years, but will always be with annual renewals because they have a limit, right? They cannot donate more. I mean, they can donate more than 2% of CSR, but why will they? So they won't donate more than 2% of their profits. And the profits will get determined every year. So those numbers can change. And every time during a renewal process, it's effectively like applying again. On the other hand, if an individual donates to you, they are then dedicated to you. If they like what you're doing, if they can connect with what you're doing, if you are able to engage them, not only will the donor give money, but his or her son, daughters will also give money to you. Right? I think this is a very important differentiator and very important thing to keep in mind that there is no time limit for which we can get money for them. So what is the amount of money that you will get? So obviously for governments and foundations, CSR, uh, the amounts of money are much higher while individual retail is obviously low in terms of how much each person gives. But remember that all of them put together can give a lot, right? I think that is the, that's the way to look at it. While each person can give little, but you can have many, many retail donors. On the other hand, you know, corporate CSR for most organizations, you'll have five, 10, 20. You can't have a lot of them. Uh, you can't have obviously as much individual retail that you have. Right. And thus the point is that the first three segments, if you look at all the criteria that we have looked at so far, they're very similar criteria. They all form in one basket. They have a similar decision-making process. They will give similar amount of money. They will take a similar amount of time. They will go through a certain process in the same way. But with individuals, that is completely different. It's very different from how these other buckets work. And that's why it's a very good source of diversification of funds. Because it, while it may be, you know, it is possible that you have 10, five corporates and you lose one, you lose 20% of your donations. And it is equally difficult to get a new corporate on board. But with individuals, yes, you might lose 20% of your individuals. Out of 100 donors, you may lose 20 donors. But it's equally easy to get another 20 back. right? So it allows your overall donations to be less volatile compared to any other segment. right? So this is, so here I, I've tried to say why it is important for individual donors to be one of the baskets of funding that you look to raise funds from. But I think that there are more reasons behind, uh, beyond this, that why an NGO should look at donations from individuals, right? So one, I've already mentioned diversification. You're not dependent on a few sources of funding. You have a diversified source of funding and an individual donor is a truly diversified source of funding compared to everyone else. If you have CSR foundation and government, you actually don't have it diversified because they all have the similar criteria. It is stable. Like I said, it's easy to lose 20%, but it's equally easy to get 20% more donors. right? And that makes it stable because it is people you know, people around you, people whom you can reach out to, are people who can give to you, unlike corporates or foundations where you may need some connects, where if you lose one corporate, it may not be as easy to get another one. So it's a lot more difficult in those cases. Unlimited. Now, this is my favorite. You know, We all talk about 2% of corporate uh, net profit is CSR and how that's such a big chunk. 
But I think the important thing to also understand out there is because this 2% number has come in, most corporates are not going to give over 2%. There is no reason now to give more than 2%. On the other hand, individual donors do not have any such limits. If they like you, they can give much more also. In fact, the giving amongst HNI donors tends to be in the 8 to 12% range. And even for an individual donor, most of them are donating very less. They're donating maybe 0.1, 0.2% of their income. And thus for them to double it is not very difficult. right? Or for them to even triple it is not very difficult. And if engaged well, they are not just donors who are giving in their lifetime, but their future generations will also give to your organization. I know many of my friends who continue to give money to places where their parents have given money. Right? I also do the same thing. I mean, I, I do that and I then give it to other places as well. But where my parents give is already is my first stop. Individuals are also the rare bucket who will fundraise for you. I have at least not heard of any other category, government, institutional, corporate, who will raise funds for you, who will refer you to other organizations. Right? So I think that's the beauty about individual donors is they can fundraise for you. They can refer other organizations. Uh, they can refer their corporates to you as well. So even when you go into a corporate, when you go into a foundation and you interact with people, remember all of them are potential individual donors. And it is important for you to look at it from that, uh, you know, that angle. That you, these are potential donors who can give to me in their individual capacity beyond what the, uh, the institution or the corporate is giving to me. And last but not the least is engagement. I think all of us are running society, uh, running NGOs to help improve society. And what better way can there be if we can engage more individuals to our cause to make society a better place because eventually that's what we all want to do. And I think in, uh, individuals gives us that opportunity to engage, gives us that opportunity to get more than just funds. And let me give an example of this. So there's an organization in uh, Bombay which helps uh, builders have crashes at their building sites. Now this is supposed something that was supposed to be there by law, right? but it is not, was not happening. One of their donors happened to be somebody who knew the municipal commissioner. And they engaged with the municipal commissioner to reach out to builders and get them to have crashes on their sites. Right now, this kind of opportunity to fulfill your cause cannot be done with any amount of money. Right? It requires the right connection. It requires the right uh, person. It requires the right engagement to be able to make that happen, which can only happen with an individual donor. And that is why I think that Individual donors are important beyond just the funds that they help bring to you. So I think we've understood that individual donors contribute a large segment of giving in this country, uh, retail donors as well. We have recognized that they are a good diversification source. We have recognized that they do more than just give money. And I think let's come to the point saying, do they want to give money? Right? And I think both, as Minu mentioned from Sattva's own research, as well as research done by independent parties even long ago, which is valid even today, we can see that India continues to be a place where uh, individuals are willing to spend more for products from socially responsible countries. Now, this is a listing of all uh, developing countries. And you see India comes out right at the top of consumers who are willing to pay more or willing to pay for products from socially responsible countries companies, which tells us that as a country, we are more aware, as an in, individuals are more aware and they're willing to do more if engaged well enough. Right. Also a lot of study around this. So we have a report which is talked about saying Indians do want to give the least cynical and most enthusiastic about driving positive change. Uh, CAF report in 2020 has talked about 80% uh, of Indians adults giving at least once a year. Uh, that's not just money, but money, money, time, and resources. Individual donations have seen strong, steady growth, 21% per year over the last three, five years by the India Philanthropy Report. So I'm just stating all these different elements to help you understand that individual donors, donations are growing. People do want to give. The challenge for us is to reach out and ask them for it. Right? Because unfortunately, 
we only look at everyday giving. We only look at retail giving when other funding streams are inaccessible. And I will, I will, I will talk about this through a lived experience that I had two years ago when COVID just started out. And in the first two months, first three months, as all other sources of funding dried up, in NGOs went all after uh, individuals to raise money for migrant workers, for the needs for food, grocery, anything and everything, even if they were not working in that space. Fantastic effort, great effort in doing that. And they raised a lot of money during those two, three months. Very few organizations after that kept it up. Very few organizations looked at these donors as potential donors whom they could get to their cause. Very few of them actually said, hey, I've already acquired so many donors. Can I engage them? Can I tell them more about my cause? Can I raise money through them for my cause? The few organizations that have been doing it since then that we have seen have continued to grow from strength to strength. They have realized that individual donors is a segment, you know, why it came out of a need at that point of time, but they realize the strategic importance of individual donors and they've continued to reach out to them. They've continued to engage them. They've continued to, uh, you know, send mailers, send appeals and continue to raise a good amount of money from the same donors, even after COVID, like over these two last two years. But now as COVID recedes in the background, they continue to raise money from individual donors. So I think that it's not yet too late. If you've raised money via individual donors during that time and you have this database, uh, would strongly urge you to engage with your donors and to try and raise money to them because people want to give just that they want to find organizations that they can trust, organizations that they can know, and organizations that are responsive to them. Uh, that's all that they ask for. So I'm going to talk about a very simple uh, you know, thing that we try to tell everyone that what do you need to do towards building an individual fundraising team, a retail fundraising unit. Uh, each of this is actually a session that we do for two, three hours or, or even a day at times that can uh, talk about how to do each of these things. But let me just put down point wise in what are these five steps towards it. The first is identification. So which is creating a donor list, creating not just people that have donated to you, but people that have supported you, contributed to you, or people that have shown interest in your organizations as one list of you know, uh, people who care about you. And another is a potential donor list. Is everyone in your circles, your board member circles, your employee circles, who you think can give. Because remember, every person you know is a potential donor. They have to be engaged. They have to be connected with, they have to, one has to create an emotional impulse in them. But they are all potential donors. We go down to the extent of saying, your branch manager that troubles you to keep deposits in his bank, he's also a donor, right? Your grocery vendor is a donor. You're, you have a milkman who's giving milk to children in your NGO is a donor. Every person that you interact with is a potential donor. And that's the list that you must make. The second is an ask. How do you ask a donor? What do you ask for? Right. So here I want to come back to this big thing that we had during this word cloud question that I asked everyone saying, what do you think of when you think of individual donors? And everyone said, a lot of you all said unrestricted funding. Right, because everything else is restricted. So this is like unrestricted funding. I can do whatever it wants. And I think, in my opinion, this is one big reason why individual donors don't give. Because they don't understand where their money is going. So if unrestricted means for you that you can use the money whichever way you want, then I think that's, a, that's the reason why a person will not give to you. You must have a program. You must have a product which is created for the individual donor. Just like you would have said for your institutional or foundation donors, you might be saying that give us 5 lakh rupees and we will educate 50 children for a year, for example. right? Why can't you say the same thing to an individual donor and say, hey, give me 10,000 rupees and I will educate one child. Or give me 5,000 rupees and I will educate a child for six months. Right? You must productize it. You must tell them what their money is being used for. And suppose you don't have need of that. The program gets fully funded. You want to use for another program. Take permission from them. I can bet you that they will all be willing and very happy that you ask them for it and be okay to spend it the way you want to spend it. 
uh, because they trust you. But don't assume at beginning itself that you can spend it the way you want to spend it. Now, if your meaning of unrestricted means that I can spend it without having to consider which program to spend it in or which person to spend it in, that is fine. I think that, that to that extent it's fine. But I think it always helps for you to have a program, a particular product, if I might put, for the individual donor, just like you have for your corporate donor, right? You don't go to your corporate donor saying, hey, I'm this organization. Hey, uh, you know, we've been around for 10 years. We are working with 500 beneficiaries and now give whatever you want to give. No, you go to them with a specific ask, with a specific project proposal, with an impact. And I think that does not change by who you're reaching out to, right? Even though the decision-making process for an individual is based on emotion, is based on impulse, they're also looking to give and they're looking to give to trusted causes. And if you are an organization which is not as well known as some of the bigger ones, then showing very clearly what the money is going to be used for will make them trust you, right? So it's also a trust building measure to say that I will use your money, for example, for buying a wheelchair for somebody, right? Which is a very simple product. And a lot of times we feel that products are not possible. Uh, and I will come to that uh, in my next slide as an example of how an advocacy organization has created products for its donors. The next is a thank you mail, I think very important. And I know, I'm sure many of you all do it within 48 hours to just send a response back to a, to a donor who has made a donation. The next step in it is retention. Do you ensure that don at least 80 to 90% of donors who have given to you in a particular year also give to you next year? That is the minimum retention you should have if you are a service delivery grassroots organization. If you are the organization providing the last mile benefit to the beneficiary, you must have a 70 to 80% retention rate. And that will not happen unless you engage the donor throughout the year. So a strong donor engagement strategy is important throughout the year to engage with donors. Right? The last step is nurturing. Once you have retained a donor, it is also important to grow a donor base. How can you grow your donor base? If somebody has given you 5,000 rupees this year, how do you make them give you 10,000 rupees next year? Or at the minimum, 5,500, 10% inflation adjustment. Right? Your costs are increasing. They must reflect in your product cost increases as well. And individual donors will not have a problem if they were giving 5,000 to give you 5,500 next year. They also understand that and it doesn't make a big difference to them because it doesn't change. They Anyway, giving a small amount of money, they're going to give a little bit more, no problem at all. But what you should be looking at is how do you make the 5,000, 10,000? Right? And again, this will happen when you've retained the donor, when you have a large number of donors and you start segmenting your donor base to say, what is my ask to different segments of my donor base? So to me, so this is a bit of a concept that once you have enough donors, once you've retained them, then how do you segment them and grow them? going forward. So uh, I was surprised that one thing that didn't come up uh, in that word cloud was compliance. So one of the common complaints I have heard from uh, NGOs is that uh, it's too much of a headache to manage compliance or to manage this with individual donors, uh, with so many donations. It's just so much easier to deal with few institutional donors, with uh, Uh, so with few institutional donors and can we, uh, you know, so that's really why we don't look at individual donors. Uh, Ashwini, uh, if I might just interrupt out here, I am having somebody who is continuously trying to take control of my screen and I'm having to keep declining that request. Uh, I'll, just so I'll just relook the settings once. Sorry yeah. about that. Right. Or uh, there's a Suresh Kumar, if you can just maybe tell him or remove him from the thing. It's disturbing the flow. Okay, right. Uh, so what are these compliance requirements that are there for individual donors? Let us understand that first. And how do we deal with them is the second thing that I will uh, take you through so that you can manage a large number of donations. Right. 
So one, there's different compliance, the myth that there are different compliance requirements for Indian and foreign donors. I'm talking of compliance requirements. I'm not talking of the bank account in which the donation goes. I know they are different, right? And the second myth is I only need to collect this information if the donor wants a tax benefit. Otherwise, I don't need to collect. That is, again, not true. So the minimum requirement that is there is name, address, and nationality. That is the minimum requirement under the law that you know the name, address, and the nationality of the donor you've collected money from, right? And now, with the new set of requirements, as all of you all must be aware, an additional ID proof is required. Uh, or only PAN number is required if somebody wants a PAN or Aadhaar is required if a tax benefit needs to be given. Other elements are required, uh, can be captured if you require, but uh, they do not provide a tax benefit. PAN or Aadhaar is a minimum. So if you do not capture name and address, your donation will be considered as an anonymous donation. The donation that has come to you can consider an anonymous donation. And beyond a certain limit, you have to pay tax at the rate of 30% on that donation. So it is highly inadvisable to not have donations without name and address, you know, beyond a certain limit. You must ensure that you get name, address, and nationality for every donation that you get. Uh, and the best way to ensure is you get it upfront rather than after the donation, because after the donation, if the donor does not contact you, then you are not going to be able to reach out. <coughs> you're not going to get that information if you're not able to contact the donor. Right? And all of this has to be done through a system, uh, especially if you have online giving. Uh, you will need a system. Even if you're doing offline giving, I think you need a system today to ensure that you are able to track all of this information. You're able to keep track of your anonymous donations. You are able to uh, send out receipts as required. Right, Even the government has now moved into this Form 10B thing, so everything is via soft copy. So eventually you need a system where you can at least send out the Form 10Bs to all your donors at the end of the year. Right, So I think it is very important to have a system which allows you to capture all this, allows you to have it, whichever system you use. Uh, I think it's important to have something which ensures that all of this is in place because compliance, as you all have known, is becoming increasingly important. And if managed with a good system, it is not a burden, it is not a worry, it is actually very empowering. I want to come to you about an organization, which is an uh, advocacy organization called Internet Freedom Foundation. Many of you all might have heard of it. Internet Freedom Foundation basically fights for the rights of internet for all of us, right? We as consumers uh, would require, want a free internet and they are the ones fighting for it. Now, because this is largely an advocacy-based organization, it cannot really create specific products. It really depends on the need of the day. They fight on many fronts, including legislative, including policy, including advocacy. And so they have created products in a different form and fashion. I'd like you to have a look at them. So they have created products and they have clearly defined what the donor will get if they subscribe to this product, right? So for example, if, I, if I'm in the internet freedom starter, I only get a monthly email. If I'm on Sathi, I get a monthly email, I get a membership letter and card. I feel good, makes me feel proud of it, right? And don't think this is just for you, for the for Internet Freedom Foundation. What stops you from also making your donors members to your organization, right? I mean, remember individual donors give because they feel proud of their giving. They feel proud of the organization that they've given to. So if you see out here, very interestingly, they have created different, different things. Supporter stickers, champion stickers, fighter stickers, mark notebook. And if you are in the topmost, you're an internet freedom visionary, you get to have a call with the IFF leadership on a quarterly basis, informing them about their progress, right? And why does this have to be only with IFF? It can be with any of your organizations. All of you are doing very path-breaking work. All of you are doing very amazing work. And uh, I'm sure donors would love to hear from you about uh, what you're doing. You know, this quarterly call is like that analyst earnings call that companies have with their investors, right? It is effectively the same thing. IFF is having it with its donors. So if, as you can see, they have created products which are completely different given the kind of organization that they are. And if IFF can do it, I don't think any of us out here can say that you can't do it. 
right? So uh, do think about it. Uh, and I have always been successful in helping organizations create a product irrespective of the kind of organization they are. And even for me, what IFF has done is very amazing, very innovative, very creative, right? Uh, so uh, let us, I mean, let's take inspiration from this and believe that each of us can create a product for the individual segment that we can reach out to them for. So I'm now going to talk about online giving and why online is a very important medium for all of you all who are looking at individual retail donations and why uh, why that is important beyond just the fact that, okay, now everything is online. Uh, it helps from an efficiency point of view as well. So let me just shift there. Okay. Uh, so just want to make sure that everyone can see my screen. Yeah, uh, Ashwini, please, can I get a, okay, then you can see, see my, yeah, yeah. Can okay. See. Right. So, uh, so why is online giving important, right? And let's kind of step back a little bit and talk about the fact that the number of online shoppers in India has doubled in the last five years. So the number of people online is increasing. If number of people online is increasing, you have got to be where your consumer is, is, is true for retail industry and is true for retail giving as well. Why am I not able to go down? Sorry. I'm just going to share from here. And digital payments in India are expected to now overtake cash payments by. 2025. So the online payments is going to be more than offline modes of payment just in the next two and a half years now. So if you do not have an online payment option today and you are looking at individual retail donors, then you need to move fast and get yourself an online payment option, right? Because everyone is moving online and you need to be there so that people can give to you very easily. I'm sorry, I'm not able to project this and move the screen. Let me just try once again. It's not going down. Um, it's, we can see it now, Dhaval. I mean, right now, yeah. I think, uh, not right now. Uh, I think you had put it in slideshow just a second back. Okay. Uh, let me do one thing. I'm just going to share it in, not share it in slideshow mode because I'm not able to move it forward. Okay. Just share it in the normal mode. Okay. And online channels for donations itself are growing at 30% year on year. You ask any crowdfund, you ask any online platform and they will tell you this, right? That it is increasing by this much. Uh, in fact, this is Satwa's own report from which we've, we've got it. So I'm quite sure it's very, very credible, right? Online donation, in addition, there are a lot of advantages to online donations beyond just the donation that is made. It's a lot more easy to engage an online donor because he's online, you can send them emails. It's a lot more easy. It's a lot more efficient. It is a lot less costly to do it. And 39% of donors come back to donate online. So if, when engaged, when they repeat, they will come back and donate. 39% of them would come back and donate online. There's a huge shift very clearly from offline to online. While this is happening a lot in the US, uh, some of this data is US based, but I think the shift is far faster in India. Digital payments in India, especially over the last two years, especially since the advent of UPI has dramatically grown. And 40% of all funds collected offline are now collected online, right? Uh, this is again a US statistic, but I think the number is gonna be much more in India, given that we've outpaced the rest of the world as far as digital payments is concerned, right? And uh, even online donations worldwide have increased by 23%. So they're growing much faster than offline payments, definitely on the rise. Yeah. And this is not restricted to a particular age group. So we think normally that the group of, you know, between 25 to 40 is the group that wants to give. But again, that's not the case. Uh, if we look at groups across the age group, so whether we look at millennial donors, whether we look at Gen X, you look at baby boomer, these are all terms the US uses. Uh, and unfortunately we don't have this kind of research in India. So I'm having to rely on US research, 
But I think the broad messaging that we are getting is across age groups, everyone is giving online. And now you might think that how does a person who's above 60 probably not as tech savvy give online. But the reality is that you know, my mother makes me do all her donations for her. She's 75 years old. She's never done anything online. But I do everything online on her behalf. Right? And I'm sure that's the case for all old donors who are giving online. That would be the case. So do not just think that because people are old, they can't give online. They have friends, family, and sons and daughters who will do it for them. Right? So this becomes very important that there is a smooth payment experience because these sons and daughters who are giving, uh, who are actually doing the giving on behalf of their parents as well, are now used to an experience of Amazon, are used to an experience of Make My Trip, are used to very high quality experiences while making online payments and require a high level of trust while doing it. And so it is very important that whatever system you build, you put up, allows for that high level of trust to be present in your uh, in your in your, on your website so that people can give very easily okay. so 48% of donors prefer to give via website again a uh, lot more of uh, statistics largely us based but i think that what is going to be there is coming here faster now or it's probably already past that number so it's very important that every single website has a donate button right there is, again, research which shows that donations increase by 190% when a donate button is easy to locate on the website. Uh, I once had an organization which sent me a newsletter. And this is a, quite a large organization, actually, very large, more than 100 crore. And maybe that's why they didn't value the retail donation. But they sent me a newsletter and uh, it just had the link to the website. So I said, uh, why aren't you keeping a link to the donate button? Uh, why don't you have either a donate button on your website or a link to the donate page? And they said that when somebody will come to my website, they will find my donate button or they will find my page. And when I went to that website, I could not find a donate button. And my point was very simple that if you don't ask for a donation, you are not going to get a donation. So if you want somebody to donate, you do not have to make it difficult for them. You know, make it easy for them to donate because the most difficult thing is making them donate, but once they have thought of donation, let there not be any hindrance till they donate, right? So ensure that it is very easy on your website to have a donate button. It's very important that it is mobile friendly, right? Uh, again, research which says that donations increase by 34% if the website is mobile friendly. Explain how the funds will be utilized. Like I said, ask for a specific purpose. As soon as you ask for a specific purpose, your explanation of how the funds will be utilized is taken care of. And it can be as simple as a one line ask, which says donate for a child's education for a year. That is good enough for a retail donor. They don't need more detail, but they need to know that much. They cannot be saying that, okay, give to my organization. That doesn't work for them. Right? So please ask for a specific purpose. Please create these purposes. You do that for corporates for large amounts. You have to do it for a retail giver for a small amount. Right? And donations will be, so again, there's value, right? I mean, research again says donations will increase by 54% if the cause of the raising funds is specified. If you tell your donor exactly why you're raising funds, you will raise more money. So while a lot of things I would say as best practices, there's research behind them as well, which says that why this is important. So ensure that your donation page is well tested, right? Now, these are basic online transaction best practices that are there. And you must have the minimum number of required, minimum number of fields. So only keep mandatory fields. Do not ask for the donor's birth date. Do not ask for the spouse's name. Do not ask for the children's name. Do not ask for which standard their children are in. Right? I, I see a lot of organizations asking for a lot of information. Birth date being the top of, uh, or top of the list. And then I get, you know, we, we all of us now get lots of mails from everyone who's collected our birthday saying happy birthday on that day. How many of them us even look at those emails? Do you think a happy birthday email, which is one amongst hundred that you have, uh, that the donor has got on that day makes any difference to him, right? Less communication, but more effective communication is the way I would go. So I think that it is, uh, ensure that it's properly tested. Make sure that whenever you make a change, 
to your donation forms on your site. They are well tested. You have uh, make sure that they uh, they are correct. Make sure that they match compliance, right? So all of this is something that you should uh, you should take care of while creating your own donation flows on your site. So a lot of what you will do when I'm saying you know have these donation pages, do online giving. A lot of our giving is being transacted online, but that does not necessarily mean that we are acquiring the donors online. In most of your cases, you will acquire donors offline. You will acquire donors through events. You will acquire donors through uh, you know through volunteer programs that you run. You will acquire donors through corporates that give to you. Uh, so there are all these offline methods of acquiring donors, which is largely what is going to happen. And then they will transact online. So the process of giving money will happen online is by and large the larger way that it is happening. But it is very interesting to note that that is also undergoing a change where donors are now being acquired and inspired online. So NGOs are acquiring donors online. So obviously a large part of that is you know, all the advertising that we see on Facebook, Google organizations doing that and acquiring donors. But I'm talking beyond that. I'm talking beyond the ad kind of thing, but social media over email, uh, all these potential donor lists that you have created, you can actually convert into givers for your cause. So I think across the board, we are seeing that uh, across segments of millennial, Gen X, baby boomer, female, male donors, people are getting acquired via social media and email, right? And this is by running a lot of campaigns on this front via social media and email to allow people to give to you. So what does this mean? I think the one thing that everybody can do is have a good email marketing strategy. And a good email marketing strategy is one where you will, so how will you acquire donors? Let's, let's take a few examples, right? One of the best ways to acquire donors is by getting your existing donors to do fundraising for you. Your existing donors are your champions. They know you as an organization and they would should be willing to raise money for you through their networks. Now, when those people give to your existing donors, they have not yet given to you as an organization. They have given to their friends. They have given to their friends they trust. They don't trust you as an organization. But now having got that donation, can you convert them to being your organization donor and not just a crowdfunding donor? And that is something you need to have an email marketing campaign, which allows you to introduce your organization, your cause, your founder, all of that to this uh, new donor and who can then become a donor for your cause. Because again, research shows that a cause donor that a donor who donates to the NGO directly gives 2x the amount of money than when he does it to a crowdfunding campaign. Because in a crowdfunding campaign, he's not giving for the cause, he's giving to the person who's raising money. Remember that. Right? So update your donors about your work. Uh, right? There's research 69% of donors will repeat if they receive communication regularly. We talked about retention as an important fulcrum of our fundraising strategy. For retention to happen, donor engagement is important. If donor engagement happens, retentions will happen, right? Again, let me talk about thank you mails being important. 68% of donors use it. Retail donors with email marketing. So we want to, I want to leave you guys before I sign off with a case study for an organization that uh, uh, decided to take the Dana Mojo platform about five years ago uh, and fundraise through uh, using our platform as a way of making the donation, right? So this is an organization called Karuna Shri. It's a palliative cancer care society, uh, cancer care organization uh, in Bangalore. Uh, and they're soon going to be coming up with their second center in Bhubaneswar as well. Now, they already had an online payment platform before uh, they came to us. So let me tell you what that was. So through their online payment platform, they were raising an average of about 18 lakh rupees a year. Over the last five years that they have come on board our platform, they now raise a crore a year. That is six times growth in six years. Now, we have not helped them raise the money. They have done the raising themselves. What we have provided them with is a stable platform, is a predictable platform, is a platform that has a high success rate and ensures great customer service 
towards making sure that they can raise more money. So going from a stage wherein they were raising, I think about less than what uh, less than half percent of their budget via uh, via online giving. Today they are raising as much as sixteen percent of their budget via online giving. Right now, this online giving helps to make it a lot more cheaper for them to raise money as well. Right, they have to spend a lot less effort on an operations front because operationally everything is taken care of uh, with our system. But this is what I want to leave with you as an example of an organization that has done really well when they really decided to pick up online giving and go and do their fundraising. This is them doing it. We've been really a support, a backbone towards helping them get there. So, uh, so that's it from my end for the purpose of this uh, conversation. Uh, I know I've given a brief overview where I think each of these topics is very, very detailed and can uh, you know have sessions for you know in itself which last for two hours, three hours, or even a day. Uh, a lot of y'all, if y'all are interested in many of these five-step processes that I spoke about, uh, we did a fundraising Friday uh, webinar series last year, last to last year, and all those videos are available on our website. So you can have a look at our website and go to fundraising Friday webinars and uh, check out the videos uh, on these various different topics. So I'll take a pause out here and, uh, you know, please feel free to put down your questions in the chat box uh, and we will take up these questions, uh, uh, you know, once we, at, during the Q&A, as Minu mentioned. Uh, and I'll ask my colleague Chitra to now, uh, you know, step in here and take you through and give you a quick brief uh, on Dana Mojo. Over to you, Chitra. Thank you, Dhawal, uh, for the wonderful insights. And I'm sure it's going to be a very helpful for everyone. And thank you, Meena, for the warm welcome. So once again, good evening to all present here. It is an honor and privilege for me to welcome you all in this platform today. So NGOs indeed do a wonderful job for the betterment of the society. And we at Dana Mojo are trying our best to help you all through our platform. So before talking in detail, just allow me to show you a small video.
so i am sure that you all must have got a glimpse of what we actually do so just let me allow now to take you through the details of this uh i'm sure my screen is visible yes chitra so dana mojo is india's first payment solutions platform for ngos and we are supported by rohan nilikani philanthropies and social alpha yes you read it right that we are the first payment solutions platform so why are we calling ourselves payment solutions platform let me just take this up front with you guys so all of us must have shopped at amazon at some point of time so what we generally do there we follow a five step process so number 1 is we look out for a product number 2 we put it into our cart number 3 we put it into the details number 4 is the payment gateway which we come across and number 5 is the thank you or the acknowledgement which we have so this is a five step process which we generally do while making this payment so now in dana mojo we are incorporating all these five steps into our platform hence we are not just the number 4 step but we are a payment solutions providing you with all these five steps coming to the platforms so we provide you with three types of platform one is the one time donations platform this is specially for the donors who want to make the donations one time second is the recurring donation platform this is the committed platform this is for the donors who want to give on a frequency like every week month year depending on their choice third is the anonymous donations platform which is also called the upi qr code platform this is specially for the donors who want to keep their name unnamed so let's talk about these three platforms which dana mojo provides a little later first i will let you know about the most important five benefits of dana mojos so we call it five c's let me start with choice so here when we integrate our widget into your website so this is more like a grid structure so here we allow you to present your ongoing project your any activity or a campaign which you are running through this customized records so in this way what happens is you definitely are giving a visibility to the donor and also a trust factor is being built because now the donor knows where exactly he wants to put his money to so definitely this structure gives a very good feel look and feel to the donor second is compliance so we are 100% legally compliant and we also take care of all these necessary details which are required also if the government comes up with some new rules or regulations related to the ngo compliance we are always there to help you all just to talk about a small example which recently happened that a new rule has come from the it that a statement of donation has to be filled with the it department declaring all the details of the donors received during that year via the form 10 bd i'm sure all of you must be knowing about this so we are delighted to announce that dana mojo has made this process very easy by downloading your form 10 bd from the dashboard which we provide you the back end system which we provide you and then directly upload it onto the it website so this definitely reduces your work to a lot of extent so in this way we are always legally compliant third is convenience so we will help you for the domestic and the international payment options both and we have a wide variety of payment options for the donors next is cost effective so after every donation is being made we provide instant automated atg receipts and the thank you notes to the donors because of this there is definitely the operational cost is lowering to a lot of extent to add to this i would just like to tell you that definitely you all must be having offline donors who give you through cash check dd bank transfers so you can also record these offline donors into our system so in this way what will happen all your offline donors your online donors all are going to be recorded into the same platform all your email addresses will be at the same place all your receipts will be at the same place and definitely this is going to lower your operational cost to a great level next is communicate so communicate has two angles to it one is the engagement campaigns so i already spoke about the thank you notes which we give along with that we have a monthly mailer which is related to the theme of the month so we send these monthly mailers to your donors on your behalf so the donors feel a kind of engagement which is being done and we have seen that due to this engagement campaigns there is definitely a 10% increase in the donation amount to you and the donor feels that you are sending it so definitely this is something which dana mojo is providing 
for your donors on behalf of you now if you want to send something to your donors so we are providing you with the email marketing platform and through this platform you will be able to send up to 10000 emails per month so you can have your uh, some records some uh, activities which are you going to come up with your annual uh, booklets anything which you want to send to your donors so you can simply use this email marketing platform and all the email addresses will be auto populated here so you need not have the uh, hassle to drag and drop each email address and simply send the emails to all your donors so definitely these five c's the five features adds to the platform a lot let me talk about the integration so integration of dana mojo's widget into your website is a very easy task it's just a few lines of html code which we provide so if you have your technical person very well and good if you don't have our technical team will provide you with all the integration also the website address has your name into it so that is one more plus point and the best part here is what i would say that when the donor comes on to this page he starts with this page ends with this page completely being on your website so i mean he is not redirected to any other page with this i would like to tell you that we have 1000 plus ngos associated with us some bigger ones like cry action aid goonj sos and many many small and mid size ngos are on boarded with danamojo just to talk about the platforms now so this is the look and feel of the one time donation platform it will have various indian payment options like card upi net banking wallet emi we have international credit card and the scan and pay option and the check dd and the bank transfer are for the offline donations which i already spoke to you second is the recurring platform so this is the recurring platform where you will be given the donor will be given the um, the frequency like you know monthly yearly half yearly the donor can choose the frequency he wants to donate to and then can put a start date and a end date to it so donor can just think that you know if he wants to put it on a birthday or some death anniversary or a special day in his life so on that occasion he can just put the frequency and with the start and the end date on that particular date that is going to be a auto debit and every time the donation is being made he will get the atg receipt and the thank you note for the same now here also i would like to put this point that many of the ngos wanted us to not have the end date they they want just to have the start date and the end date to be kept open so we also have incorporated this feature also for the ngos so we keep upgrading our features our technical team keeps upgrading the features and adds on to the platform which we are already giving to you so we are very uh, we are going to come soon with this feature where the end date will also not be there so this is about the recurring donation platform and third is the upi qr code platform so upi qr code is the easiest easiest method wherein all of us uh, do the payments these days it's simply scan and pay method but in this case the donor details are not captured and hence this falls under the category of anonymous donations so the government has allowed that you can accept the anonymous donations from rupees 1 to 1 lakh of rupee or 5% of your total donations whatever is higher so after this the tax will be applicable so in this way you can use this qr code at n number of places on like like if you have on social media you can just put on social media whatsapp you can have your project the campaign which is going on and simply put the scan code and people can donate right from you know uh, rupees 1 to rupees 1 lakh so this is the best part of this you can have on your brochures your visiting card that's the best way of donation also if the donor feels that he doesn't want to be into the anonymous category so we are still providing the feature that he can just come and enter the upi reference number and the amount and then he can get into the non anonymous category and he will be able to claim his atg receipt for the same now here we are also providing you with a setting like the uh, setting where you will be able to change the font color the theme of the widget which we are providing according to your website font color so this just gives a brand recognition so whenever a donor comes to your website he feels like you know it is all one the widget the the widget the website everything is one so it gives a good look and feel to you now coming to some more value added features which i would like to talk about so danamojo also provides you with a branded qr code where your logo is embedded into the qr code so this works more like on the mobile devices uh, we all now know that when we go to the restaurants we have these qr codes available there and when we scan these qr codes so there we can see the menu of the restaurants there 
So in the similar way, if you scan this QR code, this will take the donor to the donate now page on your website. So it is also very helpful. Next is the dashboard. So we provide you with a dashboard, which is a backend system for you. We provide the login credentials, wherein you will be able to see all the details of your donations. The front page looks like this, which will give you a glimpse of all your donations, the total number of visits people did on your website, the total number of donors, the donations, and the, and the various different tabs like donations, subscriptions. They carry all the information of your donations. And also you will be able to download these reports into Excel PDF or the CSV format from the dashboard. So this dashboard really helps you in your day-to-day -day out activities. And it is a very beneficial thing which Dhanamoja provides you. Next is we provide you with the monthly donation summary as well as the annual fundraising summary. So these all things uh, help you for your accounting and on a monthly basis, you just get to know all the summary, which is very beneficial for sure. Also to add to this, we are providing a lot of other features which will overall reduce your cost time and effort. So just to name a few, we are doing the auto separation for the Indian and the foreign donations for you. We provide the phone and the email support completely. So our after sales support team is very efficient and you will not find phone support everywhere. But Dana Mojo provides phone and email support both as well. Talking about data security and privacy, so we being a payment solutions platform, we completely take care of your data. Your donors are your donors and we do not share that data with anyone. Talking about website monitoring. So many a times it might happen that your website is hung for some reason and you might not know about it. You might have a 404 error or it is just stuck for some reason or maybe you are under the restructuring of your website. So in this case, our technical team is doing a website monitoring for you. And we will let you know if your donation is being hampered for any reason. Again, in such cases, we used to provide a branded web page to you so that you can forward this link to your donors for the donations to proceed. Again, our technical team has worked on this branded web page, and I'm happy to share that we have come up with a micro site altogether. So once, the, once you send this link to the donor, he will open the link and he will come to a micro site, which is very lively and colorful. And he will see the same structure which you are having on your widget. So in this, in this way, your donations won't be hampered and they will just go on. So there are many NGOs who don't have a website currently or they are working on their website process and they are using our branded web page or the micro site, I would say, for, for years together, I would say. So this is just a help to you to resume or to continue your donation process till the time your website is all set in place for the integration to happen. After these features, I would just like to let you know about how a traditional payment gateway really works. So definitely if you want to install a payment gateway on your own website, so you will need a website developer, a payment gateway, a hosting provider, and definitely a team of operations. And all of this costs you a hell lot of rupees. The annual charges goes to one to two lakh of rupee. But with Dana Mojo, we are providing you multi showcase format of your projects, 100% legally compliant donor forms, donor, domestic international payment options, instant automated ATG receipts, donor engagement campaigns, email marketing platform, and much more. And I would say that our annual charges are just far, far lower. They are just between 2999 to 999. Now, I will not be able to take the pricing in detail here, but yes, we can definitely one on one discuss about the details of the pricing post the call or post the presentation. After this, I would also like to bring you to a very important feature of Dana Mojo. So we are providing you with a 0% transaction fee option. So what I mean by this option is you can have a small note in your widget down there, like you can see that you are asking for an extra 5 to 10% or 8%, 10% to your donors, that extra money you are charging to cover your admin expenses, your overhead expenses. So an NGO can definitely request that extra amount to your donors. And there is a checkbox here where it is written, I will cover the transaction charges. And we have seen that when the donor is giving you so much of amount for the donation, 60 to 80% of donors are happily giving you this extra amount. So definitely with less effort, like, you know, in fact, in this uh, feature, without taking any other effort, without taking extra effort, little more of amount is coming to the NGOs uh, with every donation. 
so it makes a lot of difference here and uh, you can definitely uh, you know uh, use this uh, use this extra amount in wherever whichever place you want to so this is a very good feature i would say uh, with this uh, i will just try to show you the end of the presentation uh, considering the various awards which we have won and especially the nascom social innovation award also this is something which our what our uh, ngos have to talk about us and this is something what our investors have to talk about us so before just ending this i would like to tell you all that consider dana mojo to be a overall platform where which is helping you not only for getting in your payment uh, payment gateways but also just a second i think it just got stuck yeah sorry so it is uh, it is also um, it is like a overall platform which is helping you to reduce your operational cost to a lot of level by the various ways which we did and also trying to increase the amount of donations which the features which i just mentioned to you so all these uh, the emails the which we send the uh, the uh, transaction cost thing the atg receipts everything is helping you to everything is helping you to reduce your operational costs and increase the donation amount just give me a second i think this presentation is stuck so okay i think that's it from our end anyway yeah so uh, that's it would yeah. love to take so just wanted to let you all know yeah yeah sure that will just just second so i would just like to uh, request you all that if you like our platform if you're really interested in this online donations platform uh, and see the holistic donation platform which will definitely help you for reducing your overall cost effort and time please go to danamojo.org and fill the inquiry form which will come to us also you can email us at care@danamojo.org i will put this both of these uh, into the chat window right now and once you do this uh, the emails come to me come to us and we will definitely contact you and do a one on one session to have a more detailed discussion on the platform uh, and the various other features so here i would open it to the question and answers um uh, thank you chitra just one more point do you want to also talk about uh, uh, the Uh, offer for the participants of the webinar uh yeah so so i don't have that slide right now here with me but i can just say that uh, so we have different pricing modules for the different uh, platforms so it is more like the one time donation platform recurring and the anonymous platform and also we have uh, divided our pricing modules into three plans which is the standard advantage and the premium plan so right now uh, for the recurring platforms we are providing you uh, you all with a 40 to 50% of discount in the prices for the first year of the subscription so um, so as i just mentioned you uh, you can just um, once we connect once we connect one on one i can tell you in more in details but a 40 to 50% discount is given for the recurring platform also if you go for more than one platform with us we are providing with a flat 10% discount to you so this is the offer this is something which we would really like to uh, suggest to you so that you can enquire with us and uh, join us, join with dana mojo family great uh, thank you so much chitra i think it might be useful to also share the a uh, mail id on the chat uh, yeah. for quick reference uh, for all the participants um, yes. uh, but thank you so much both dawal and chitra for this amazing session um, uh, i'll request the participants to either uh, unmute yourself speak up uh, uh, and share your questions or put your questions on the chat uh, there was a question that we received um, um, which was on uh, the the uh, the solution the payment solution itself the question is can we add email addresses of people who have not yet donated um, uh, to the organization uh, to the email marketing list or is it limited to those who have donated through the dana mojo platform 
So, so right now, all the recordings of the uh, people who have donated through the Dana Mojo platform will be recorded into the system, and also the on offline donors, which I just which I mentioned some time back. So once you also uh, include the offline donors into the list, so all these addresses will be in a compiled one list. So you will be able to send the email, use the email marketing platform for all these donors, your offline as well as online, which are registered into the platform. Thanks, thanks, Chitra, for clarifying that. Um, again, uh, request the participants to uh, please uh, share your questions uh, based on the session that uh, um, um, Dhaval took up, as well as if you have any specific questions on the platform, the payment platform itself. You can either put it out on the chat or uh, unmute yourself and speak. Yeah. yeah, 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 Ms. Nisri. Yeah, uh, if uh, the donor does not opt for the transaction charge, then how much are we charged? Uh, so that depends on the different plans and platform that you pick up. Uh, I think uh, as Chitra said that maybe you can fill out the inquiry form and we can do a more detailed one-on-one -on -one demo. Uh, and take you through uh, all those pricing and charges and all of that uh, out there. Okay. okay. Uh, would love to take questions on, uh, you know, uh, on the first part of the presentation out here. Uh, because I think the Dana Mojo questions can also be taken uh, when you uh, just fill out the inquiry form and you can, uh, you know, and then Chitra will take you through a demo and answer each of the specific questions. I know each person will have many questions. Uh, which will be quite different, but happy to take out here at least the question more related to the first part, which you may not get a chance to ask uh, some other time. So let me know if there are any such questions. Yeah, I'm surprised. I was expecting a lot of questions on the retail fundraising piece. Right. I think there was one question uh, from somebody who talked about saying, uh, can you let us know about uh, donors living abroad? I think Govind uh, had asked this question, that can you talk about donors living abroad? I, I uh, If Govind's on this call, it would be great if you can expand on this question and uh, we can uh, try to address it. Okay. Uh, so, you know, you, uh, thanks for remembering it. Uh, you know, my question was mostly uh, related to FCRA donations. Uh, you know, you talked about CSR, and then you talked about these personal donations. Uh, but uh, did you miss the FCRA part, or uh, it was included in the individual uh, donations? So, uh, Gobind, I was more speaking about donations being made by Indian companies or Indian donors. Uh, because we were talking about saying, how much do people in India give? Uh, oh, so, okay. Okay. So the institutional part or the foreign donors part was not a segment of this, but foreign donations account for somewhere between fifteen to twenty thousand crores of uh, donations every year. And a lot of that comes from individual donors again, uh, or no? Uh, it's from institutions. So I mean, I would say anecdotally, most of that is from institutions. Uh, very little okay. of that is from individual donors. But okay. again, we okay. don't we don't have the data. There is no data being released to say they give percentages around it. Okay. Okay. Right. Thanks. Uh, okay. Any other questions? Uh, uh, I wanted to ask one question. Uh, so my name is Kushal uh, from Monkey Sports. So like the like the data you mentioned about the increase in uh, the number of retail donors so who have increased in the last five years. Uh, so my question is like like do we know like where do these people actually reside? Because like my NGO is in like a small place in Chhattisgarh, uh, and all my like stakeholders, beneficiaries, and even target people who may contribute. My family member maybe in smaller town. And they, I, I do not see that if they will be 
that comfortable using uh, the online mode of thing to make the payment uh, so just just wanted to ask like because we know this data is increasing but is it just like for the bigger cities or do you see the trend trend everywhere like in india so i think if you i think when we look at where online donations is increasing i think it will follow a very similar path to how online e-commerce has happened where it will obviously start from the larger cities the metros but percolate very soon to tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 cities so i think for all uh, e-commerce platforms today tier 3 4 5 and 3 4 5 and so on cities now account for well over 50% of all their uh, you know uh, deliveries so i think that uh, we will i mean if that has not already happened i think we will soon see it happen because something like upi has become very common place remember upi is also digital mode of payment you can go with a qr code and you can just ask someone to scan it i think that at least is very common and very prevalent right uh, my question to you though is kushal have you asked them for donations yeah that's a good question yeah and uh, that like means I, you not ask them for donations and, and it's easier to ask digitally because like uh, you don't have to actually face them in person and like because like that is also a thing like uh, like maybe like uh, asking for money like going and it's like uh, yeah so like social media and it's it provides like a better platform like you don't have to go to someone and talk directly and asking for money yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, right, Kushal. So I think the problem is not with people giving online, but with us being able to ask offline. Right? Like I said, I think you cannot think that you can ask online to not have to ask offline, uh, because people will, like I said, you have to acquire donors offline. Acquiring donors online is a costly process. It's a more evolved process and more suitable for larger organizations. smaller organizations will always have to acquire the donor offline but and tran make the donor transact online so he has to be ready to give offline you have to connect with him offline talk to him offline and then he may give online and subsequent donations you can try more focused email marketing campaigns and so on but i think the initial one will always have to be offline um there will there is also a question around does telecalling and face to face work for acquiring retail donor donors right so obviously uh, telecalling and face to face works i mean most of the large organizations do it so one definitely cannot say that it doesn't work uh it's obviously a very it's a lot more expensive one which requires investments uh and if you have a large uh, you know ability to make a large investment uh in this initiative and to have a period of maybe 3 to 5 years before you start breaking even uh then it may be worth going into it a uh, lot of learnings around this as well and i think one has to speak to organizations that have done it to see what's the best way of doing it uh, most organizations that have been widely successful at it do it in house uh, the ones who do it uh, with agencies the cost of that is just far too much to have any possibility of break even for a very long period as well so i think if you can do it in house then you will have you can have really low cost i mean i know large organizations that do it in house at a cost which is uh, 15 to 25% which is really low uh, compared to what you would if you had agencies to do it for you okay, yeah so um, i hope i hope vikas that answers your question uh i think dr john has asked you market the campaigns of ngos uh no dr john we are not a cam uh, fundraising platform so we don't do that um uh, dhawal i had a question which usually comes to me from smaller ngos right so sure. uh, especially ngos in tier 2 cities and so on in terms hmm. of the first step that you mentioned identifying the donors right so usually they are like where do we start from right like the people and when we say your circle they are like they not sure of their ability to donate or their willingness to so how do we start with creating one this list second uh, i think adding to what kushal said right this communicating uh, to people about uh, uh, the need to donate like how how do you do that right if there are any uh, tips towards that that would be super useful 
Sure. So I think that, you know, any organization that I started off with obviously got support from some people uh, in its initial days to start off and raise money. And I think that, uh, like I said, our problem is not about whether people will give money or not. Our problem as a sector is whether we are ready to ask for money or not. Right. And I think that is very important that we have to uh, start becoming shameless. And I will use a strong word. So that's something, you know, uh, that in asking for money, because we have to remember that we are not asking for ourselves. We are asking for those who are underprivileged. We are asking for those who do not have it to help them improve their lives. And I think that is very important. So, you know, if when we are not asking for ourselves and we are asking for a higher cause, uh, what is the harm in asking? At the worst, you will get a no. And that is okay, right? Uh, I think what tends to happen is a lot of uh, NGO founders tend to come in, are coming in from more the operation, the program side of things, where, uh, you know, program side and operation generally tends to work. You have like a 90% success ratio in whatever you do. But on the sales side, it's the other, it's the inverse. You will have a 10% success ratio. So if my point is if one out of 10 people agrees to donate to you, remember you have won. You have not lost. Just because nine person, nine people said no doesn't mean anything. The one person who said yes means everything. So uh, it's okay to not to get a no, but that does not mean you should stop asking. You must keep asking. You must build a base. Like we tell everyone, I think it's important to build a potential donor list. And that potential donor list starts from more immediate friends and family, kind of goes outwards, you know, starts from people who you are most connected to and then moving out certain levels. So it will start from friends, family, relatives. Then it will be college alumni, batchmates. Then it could be people who we do business with or who we do, who we have interactions with. Like I said, your CSR program manager on the corporate side is a donor. Your bank relationship manager is a donor. Your grocery shop from where you make your purchases is a donor, right? Everyone that you interact with is a potential donor whom you must try to engage with your cause. And I think that if we, we have to ask, I think that we cannot get away from this point that how, uh, you know, will the person give? Will the person give is his decision to make. Your duty is to ask. So if you don't even make that ask, you're not allowing that person to give to you even if he wants to give. Because nobody will give if you don't ask. I think that is very important. Thing to remember and the uh, so i think that it's building that potential donor list is very critical so that you can actually start asking them the next thing to do is uh, once you have donors is to motivate to them to become fundraisers for you and when they become fundraisers they will bring in a lot more donors via crowdfunding and these are donors whom you will who as an organization you should try to convert to cause donors what i was mentioning that they should become donors to your NGO, not donors to that uh, donor of yours or the champion donor. So up till now, they have donated to his crowdfunding campaign. Now they should start donating to the organization itself. I think that is very important. Uh, that entire strategy of how do you make that happen is a very critical uh, strategy. Apart from that, I think every organization has certain strengths and weaknesses, certain strengths which they have to leverage. Let's, uh, for example, some, some call... NGOs would have a great corporate program. They would have a lot of CSR funding, fantastic volunteering programs, corporate connect programs. I think they need to start asking their donors, uh, these corporate volunteers to start donating to them as individuals beyond the CSR part of it, right? So CSR is what the company gives, but these volunteers can also give individual donations. Many organizations provide scholarships to underprivileged students to do uh, medical or engineering studies. These organizations should now start reaching out to these people when they start earning, asking them to give back to the organization, give back to that organization that helped them to get here in life. And I think it will be a very, very successful program. So I think every organization uh, has certain strengths which it has to leverage and work in that direction to raise uh, donations. Uh, what I actually do as a pro bono activity is I am uh, happy to kind of uh, do brainstorming sessions with NGOs to help them understand which area they could work on, which area they could look at to be able to uh, maximize their fundraising capacity. Uh, so I, I do that. I do this on Sundays, letting everyone know. I do this on Sundays, but I will ask you for a lot of information so that I can study your organization and I can understand 
what your strengths are and what can be leveraged uh, to grow your fundraising. So if any of you all are interested, you all can you know get in touch with the email ID that Chitra has put down and then we can uh, take it forward from there. Right? Uh, and I think you know, the last point was around communication uh, that you mentioned. And I think, like I said, there has to be a donor engagement strategy that comes into place as and when you start getting new donors. Okay. Yeah. No, thanks, Tamil. Thanks for that. I think there's a question uh, from Nikesh. So he asks, uh, which approach works better for retail fundraising? Is it showcasing the impact the organization has created or the problem that they're trying to solve, the problem in the society? Okay. So I would say neither for a retail giver. I would say for a retail giver, what will make the most impact is what his donation can help achieve. He is not interested in what your organization does. He is not interested in what society does, uh, problems in society, because he or she cannot solve those problems. He or she wants to know what problem they, he or she can solve. And if you can tell them that you can, the problem that they can solve with 5,000 rupees or 10,000 rupees, then that is what will move a donor to donate. It's the equivalent of saying that, for example, there are 10 million illiterate, uh, I mean, children who are malnourished in India, uh, just as a number, I'm not sure what the exact is, but I'm just quoting an example. Uh, most people will, have, will not be able to relate to this because they don't know what to do it, how to go about it, or whether they can solve the problem. And certainly they can't, and then it becomes a government's problem to solve. But if you can tell them that you can provide a midday meal to a child for 1100 rupees a year, then that's a tangible problem that the donor has solved for. So give them bite-sized problems which they can actually solve, and, the, and that's how donors will convert. Thanks, Dawid. Uh, I think there was a question around uh, PAN card and other, which I believe Chitra has responded to. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so any last questions, maybe we can take one more question if uh, there is any. Great. So I think uh, maybe we can wrap up the session. Um, so once again, uh, thank you so much, Dawal and Chitra, for kind of uh, anchoring this session. I think, uh, at least to me, this was super insightful. Uh, and even the, the platform piece was really interesting as well, right? So uh, I hope uh, the participants kind of look through the platform. If you all are interested to know, know more about it, do write to the team. Uh, I think uh, we have shared the uh, uh, the link and the email ID in the chat. So please make sure that if you want to know more about the platform, do write to them. And thank you so much, all of you, for joining the session and participating in the session. Uh, and thanks once again, uh, Dhawal and Chitra. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. And Meenu, if you'd be okay, there is a WhatsApp group for fundraising with NGOs. Okay. So if you're okay, uh, can I share that link in the chat window? Absolutely, for sure. Okay. So guys, I'm just sharing this link. We've created a link for uh, a group where people can talk about fundraising. So if you're interested, do join in. Thank you, everyone. That's a great yes, fine. We'll also uh, kind of share all the details, right? The the Danamojo uh, details and the presentation and so on. Uh, post the session. So uh, you can expect it by tomorrow. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful session.